Are we live? Are we good? Hello, everybody. I am Kayla Parnell, and I am one of the abdominal wall reconstruction fellows at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We'll be talking about chronic groin pain, and we have Dr. David Kurpata here joining us to moderate the session. He is our chronic groin pain expert at the Cleveland Clinic who gets a ton of referrals all around the country. And we also have Dr. Kevin Baer who will be helping to present the material at the end of the hour. He'll be presenting two papers that uh, discuss chronic groin pain. Um, so throughout this discussion, feel free to ask questions in the chat, uh, raise your hand and you know, make it as interactive as you'd like it to be. And we would love to just answer questions and we'll save some time at the end to have a good discussion. So without further ado, we'll get going. So I'll spend the first 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, just talking about how we work up chronic groin pain in our clinic at Cleveland Clinic. And then after that, we'll go into the papers. So let me, everyone can see my screen okay? Good, okay, so the overview of this talk will be discussing one, why do we care? Two, how is chronic groin pain defined? Three, how do we approach a clinic patient? And then four, what are the outcomes and expectations that we can expect for these patients and how can we counsel them? So why do we care? The lifetime risk of inguinal hernias is 27 to 43% in men and three to 6% in women. So the number of inguinal hernia operations is over 20 million worldwide annually. So that's a lot of hernia repairs. And interestingly, the risk of recurrence is now lower than the risk of chronic groin pain. So there's been two large registry-based trials, one out of Denmark, one out of Sweden with over 20,000 patients in each. And you can see the recurrence rates on, for each of these studies. So in the Denmark paper, you know, 10% recurred after a tissue-based repair, 6% after an open anterior mesh Lichtenstein repair, and 3% after lap preperitoneal. And in the Sweden trial, or the Sweden study, 1.3% uh, of hernias repair after an open anterior mesh repair, and then 0.8 to 2.5% recur after a preperitoneal mesh. And then look at the chronic pain risk. So in that same Swedish trial of over 22,000 patients, which we'll talk about that paper later in this presentation, 15 to 18% of people complain that their pain interfects, uh, interferes with their daily concentration. And nine to 14% of people say that it interferes with the, their daily activities. There was a really great 2018 guidelines set forth by the hernia surge group. It was, you know, there's over 900 citations in this paper. A group of experts around the world got together and came up with these guidelines. And I'll be referring to these throughout this presentation. But they said overall 10 to 12% of people have clinically significant pain. So it's moderate in severity. It interferes with their daily activities. And around 0.5 to 6% of patients have debilitating pain. So if you say like 11% of patients will have a clinically significant chronic groin pain, you know, experience after their hernia repair, and there's 20 million worldwide uh, inguinal hernia repairs, that's 2.2 million people a year with clinically significant pain. So that's why we're talking about it. And there's no real standardized way to treat these people, work them up, uh, and we don't really have a great training in our residency programs on how to um, address these patients. So. That's why we're talking about it. Uh, so how is it defined? Uh, it's defined as pain over three months after surgery, but if they've haven't had a mesh-based repair, uh, the international guidelines say you should consider over six months to allow the inflammation around the mesh to heal. The severity needs to be at least moderate and impacting their daily activities. Um, people experience pain in, a couple, in several different ways. And the two main ways that we define pain in the groin is we try to find out is this neuropathic in the etiology or is it snosusceptive? So neuropathic is you know, any nerve damage. So transection of the nerves, stretching, crushing, it can cause entrapments, neuromas. And you know, these are the common nerves in the groin. So the ilioinguinal, the iliohypogastric, the genital branch of the genital femoral. On the other hand, anything that's not associated with nerve pain, we call nociceptive pain. So that's inflammation, mesh malposition, meshoma, inflammation of the pubic bone, adductor tendinitis, hip pathology. Uh, the hernia surge group came up with 
uh, risk factors for chronic groin pain uh, in the preoperative period. You can see that young women with a high pre-op pain level tend to have higher post-op pain. Um, also, people who undergo recurrent hernia operations have a higher risk of post-op chronic groin pain. In terms of the perioperative, um, you know, during the operation period, the patient, surgeons with less experience uh, have been associated with higher um, groin pain. Also open repair technique, heavyweight mesh, fixation, and ilioinguinal nerve neurolysis. And just to make a little point about that, what they mean in this paper by that is people who um, mobilize the nerve when it looks like it's gonna be interfering with the mesh, but then they leave the nerve in situ where the mesh can be involved with it. Th those are the patients that have a tendency to have higher pain. So the recommendations from the hernia surge group is if it looks like the nerve is going to be involved with the mesh, you should resect it at that point. So you should do a practical resection, but that they don't recommend that you should just go in and cut all the nerves for everybody. They recommend a practical resection. Um, and then for post-operative risk factors, people with hematomas, infections, and early, early high post-op pain. So how do we work up a clinic patient? So whenever you know someone had, comes into your clinic, they had an inguinal hernia repair a year ago, what are you gonna ask them? So you wanna ask them when did this start? How long has it been going on? I think it's interesting to ask patients if they felt a bulge pre-op, because sometimes patients who don't feel a bulge in their groin and they just say, I just had pain. You know, I didn't feel a bulge, but I had pain. And then they get a mesh put in their groin and they still have that pain. Makes you think that something else was going on instead of their hernia. Um, ask them again, is this inf impacting their life? How severe it is? Try to figure out if this is neuropathic or nociceptive. I'll go into that in a little bit. And then of course, review the op notes. You got to figure out where the mesh is. Is it preperitoneal? Is it on the, was it an open approach? Did they fixate? What did they do with the nerves? What type of mesh is it? And then also look for any musculoskeletal issues. And, um, some of these patients have a psychiatric history and, Referral to a psychologist seems to help as well. So the main things for neuropathic pain that you want to look for on exam and history are anything with the nerves. So that sharp burning shooting sensation um, and repetitive uh, stimulation to those nerves like physical activity will also exacerbate this. So they feel better when they just rest. On exam, these people have maximum points of tenderness along specific nerve distribution patterns. And they have abnormal skin sensations. So allodynia, pain from a normal stimulus or hyperalgesia. So exacerbated pain from a painful uh, stimulus. Versus nociceptive pain. So this is pain that's not attributed to nerves. That's that foreign body sensation. Patients say that, you know, it's exacerbated when they sit in a car for a long time. They just have to get up and stretch their legs or they have to, you know, lean back and extend that leg or crossing that leg over the contralateral leg uh, tends to exacerbate it. Then on exam, it, they have pain to deep palpation of the inguinal ligament. Sometimes you can feel a lump or a meshoma um, and they don't really have po points of maximum tenderness like the neuropathic group does. Um, so on physical exam, I kind of just discuss that. Um, try to palpate the mesh. Are they diffusely tender? Are there maximum points of uh, pain? look for recurrences and derm dermatosensory mapping has been helpful, um, has been found helpful to work up these patients. So it helps to identify if there's clearly a neuropathic etiology versus the non-neuropathic etiology. So the way we do it in our clinic is um, we have the patient lay down, close their eyes and we use a marking pin and we first start at an area outside of the affected area. Um, and we, place, you know, just a pin mark right there. And that's their normal sensation. And so after that, we go in a systemic sequence from their umbilicus down onto their leg. And if they have pain, we put a positive sign. And if they don't have any pain and have numbness, we put a negative sign. And so you end up with a pattern, something like this. And this is, these are pictures from Dr. David Chin's, um, one of his papers where he looked at pre-op and post-op dermatosensory mapping before he did a triple neurectomy on some of these patients. And he found that there was a um, high correlation with um, dermatosensory mapping with mechanical and pressure um, in the pre-op stage. And there was a high association with um, um, hypo 
anesthesia. So they did not feel as much postoperatively and same with um, hot and cold. So there, there was an association when he compared dermatosensory mapping to um, uh, QST or quantitative sensory testing. Um, in terms of a management algorithm. Okay, so what are you gonna do with all these patients? We'll go through these kind of one by one. So the first one is start with some imaging. So that could be an ultrasound, CT or MRI. You wanna make sure there's not a recurrence and you can look for a meshoma or other causes of pain. In our clinic, we like to use a dynamic ultrasound. And on the left here, I just snap, I just screenshotted one of our patients um, dynamic ultrasound. And this is what all it shows. It's pretty um, thorough. They tell you if there's a hernia and they look at all of the nerves in the groin and they can tell you if it looks like there's a neuroma or enlargement of the nerves consistent with neuritis. Um, they look at the rectus abdominis adductor complex looking for tearing um, of any of those muscles. And they look at the pubic synthesis and the adductor muscles of the leg as well. Next, if you've ruled out a recurrence um, and there isn't necessarily a specific meshoma that you're feeling that you think you need to go after the mesh and you think this could be potentially more of a, of a neuropathic etiology or even still if it's part of the mesh, referral to a multidisciplinary pain team is helpful. Um, sometimes physical therapy, if you feel that the, if you see that there's some acute tearing in some of the tendons um, is also helpful. And the hernia surge group recommends to start with some conservative modalities of um, some medications. What's the data behind that? The hernia surge group, they did a extensive systemic, uh, systematic literature review and there's very scarce evidence out there on pharmacologic options. So they only found one case report using gabapentin and that did show a long time, long-term pain improvement. However, there's two small studies looking at lidocaine patches and capsaicin patches, which showed no benefit. And there's no studies that existed on physical therapy, acupuncture, and TENS for chronic groin pain patients. So they say to start with this because it's low risk, but just know that it often doesn't work and the data is not great for it. Um, going on to nerve blocks and peripheral nerve stimulation um, or just you know nerve-directed therapies, nerve blocks can be helpful helpful to diagnose, um, you know, specific nerves that are involved. Overall, the hernia surge group, they can't make any recommendations based on this, but they are, they recognize that nerve blocks are an important diagnostic, uh, have an important diagnostic function and they can be effective treatments. So they included three studies in their review. One was a randomized control trial with 12 patients and it showed no difference. It did not produce pain relief. And then another study of 43 patients, they looked at retrospectively and 32% of patients had relief. And then there was one case report that showed that a genital femoral nerve block was effective. In terms of cryoablation and peripheral nerve stimulation, um, cryoablation looked effective. There are two case series uh, with small numbers so showing 77% of pain reduction. And in this case report, there were pain free for two months after cryoablation. In terms of the um, peripheral nerve stimulation and dorsal root ganglion, ganglion stimulation, um, they showed 71% and 75% pain reduction. So they said these are effective, but again, there's not a lot of literature. And then last but not least, um, to kind of wrap up this part of the presentation, for surgical interventions, there are, you know, the main two surgical interventions that we have are going after the nerves, neurectomies, or taking out the mesh. In terms of mesh removal, the hernia surge group could not come to any conclusion uh, about removing mesh alone. They found nine papers that discuss this. Uh, five were retrospective. And so out of a total of 278 operations that they found that discussed mesh removal, 82% also combined a triple neurectomy or some type of a tailored neurectomy. So they couldn't really make a uh, recommendation on this, but they found that efficacy rates were 60 to 100% in reducing pain. So, um, you know, there's a role for it, but they couldn't de definitively tell us anything. Whenever you do this, of course, you know, the mesh could be in different locations. So, you know, if it's a proline hernia, hernia symptom, a proline hernia system, it could be in the posterior and the anterior plane. So just knowing exactly where this mesh is.
um, is, uh, what you'll have to do to tackle this. Earlier this year, there was a really good systematic review that looked at just surgical treatments for chronic groin pain. And they looked at papers that discussed mesh, um, a meshectomy in the first column right here versus just a selective neurectomy in the next column versus triple neurectomies. And you can see out of all these papers, there's only one paper by Sluter, which included 14 patients that just took out the mesh and did not mess with the nerves. And in this paper, they found that the mean pain scores dropped from eight to four out of 14 patients. It was not randomized, but um, it showed good data for that. Uh, in terms of a neurectomy only, they found, again, poor quality of literature because it was heterogeneous, um, but they found 25 papers. And out of seven studies that discussed lap triple neurectomy, about 85 to 100% of patients had pain reduction. Um, and they said out of 18 studies that had a tailored approach, there were lower success rates. So overall, the hernia surge group says open and lap uh, neurectomies do provide acceptable outcomes, um, but whether you do a selective or a triple neurectomy should be left to the surgeon and it should be a tailored approach with or without mesh removal based on what the patients um, are feeling and a high level of expertise is needed to have a good outcome. And then this is the last slide, but or second to last slide, but back to that systematic review. There was only one trial in, all, in this whole systematic review that was a randomized trial and it had 54 patients. And this is the only trial also that looked at just selective mesh, selective neurectomy, not triple neurectomy and not mesh removal. And out of 54 patients, they can, they randomized patients to either a repetitive tender uh, point injection or an open selective neurectomy based on, you know, that diagnostic block. And they found that that selective neurectomy was 71% effective over only 22% uh, success in the tender point group. Um, and if you look at the patients that undergo triple neurectomies, you can see that the success rate is slightly higher than just a selective neurectomy. So the success rates are 95, 87, and 81%. So overall, the risk of chronic groin pain is higher than the risk of recurrence. And if you're going to treat these patients, allow at least six months before diagnosing it as chronic groin pain, if they've had mesh, um, determine the severity, determine what type of pain they have, and just, you know, do a stepwise approach, including pain, man pain management, physical therapy, a psychologist, you know, start with medications, nerve blocks, and then consider a special center specialty center whenever you're moving to neurectomy and mesh removal and just know that everyone's different and you got to treat their unique situation differently. Thank you very much. That was a lot. Um, that was uh, a great overview, Kayla. Um, one, of the, one of the things that just that kind of sticks out to me um, is something that I've learned over years is that uh, and I, I think I blame Ajita Prabhu for, for, for this, is that she would always kind of try and push me to make these algorithms for surgeons when we would do our um, general surgery updates courses. And one of the things that that has forced me to do is to realize that there is no perfect algorithm for a chronic groin pain patient. Um, and I think that each patient does have a lot of individual things that you have to consider for their management. And I, I think I last time I presented on this, I, I think about it more as like a matrix. And one of the things that you really have to do when you decide whether or not to operate on a patient with chronic groin pain is to determine what the overall impact of the operation is gonna be for them. And that is recognizing that this is a very different operation than what we think of as typically as, as surgeons, which is, okay, you're gonna go in, you're gonna fix a hole, you know, our hernia has a hole, there's a defect, we're gonna make it go away and put some of these abdominal wall back together. It's a very clear objective uh, from the beginning to the end. And there's an anatomical change that you should expect. But in this, there's no anatomical change. You're doing an operation and at the end, you're gonna see whether or not there was a result that you that you hope you know, you're making this patient better. And so these are truly just quality of life operations. These are not cancer. And so you really have to talk to people about 
the the benefit of the operation and what they're hoping to get out of it. And if they feel like, well, they have a low level of pain, but it's it's nagging, you know, you really have to present the risks of the operation to them and say, does this does this quality of life improvement really match the risk of the operation? Which is, you know, with mesh removal, I think you know can be significant if it's you know, a laparoscopic removal, there's risk of not only the hernia coming back after you take the mesh out, but risk of vascular injury, bladder injury, uh, risk of testicular loss for, for men. So it's just one of the things that I, I think a lot of times we try and fit things into algorithms and sometimes things just don't fit into algorithms. And you really got to take these patients individually and, and sort of spend time with them because they don't just, you know, plug and plug and play uh, into the pathway. All right. So next we will, thank you so much um, for that uh, moderation. Does Dr. Petro have a question? I was just looking at the chat box. There's a lot of chats going on. Um, well, let's go on to Dr. Kevin Bear. He's gonna present two papers. And then after he discusses these two papers, then we'll have a more in-depth discussion and answer all the questions in the chat box. So thank you, Kevin. Go ahead. Awesome, can you see my slides? Yes. All right. <clears throat> um, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here and thanks Kayla for the, for the rundown on how to evaluate these patients in the office. Um, so, the first um, paper that we're going to talk about um, comes from Sweden and it was published in 2018. And so this is a prospective cohort study um, utilizing PROs as well as the Swedish attorney registry um, and um, to, to evaluate patients who underwent uh, elective unilateral hernia repairs. Um, and so their primary outcome was persistent pain at one year and uh, secondary outcome measured was um, recurrence. So uh, inclusion was age over 15 and then elective unilateral groin hernia. So that could be primary or recurrent and the exclusion criteria were suture repair. And so every patient was only counted once. So if they had a left and had a right a few years later, they couldn't be included again. Um, so uh, the patients were identified between 2012 and 2015, and all these patients received a mailed questionnaire uh, at one year post-op. Um, and if they got no answer, then they sent a, a follow-up at 30 days. Um, and so the registry additionally was queried to identify any patients who went to re-operation on the same side. Um, and then uh, they did two uh, kind of interesting things. They did an analysis of the loss to follow-up um, where they, where they um, randomly selected people who didn't respond to the questionnaire and did a telephone interview. Um, and then they did a reliability test where they um, randomly selected patients who responded to the questionnaire and sent them a follow-up, uh, the same questionnaire a month later to see if their responses were the same. So um, for the PROs, um, they basically it was this one question from the uh, inguinal pain questionnaire, um, grade your, the worst pain you felt in your operated groin during the last week. And so what the authors did was they kind of made the cutoff um, a score one to three as no pain and a score four to seven chronic pain. So the same thing that Kayla was talking about has to be pain that interferes with everyday activities. So um, their consort diagram uh, was pretty easy to follow. There were um, 32,000 questionnaires sent. They received 24,000 replies, um, which is about 75%, um, which, is, which is really good. Um, ultimately for the analysis, 22,917 patients. Um, and so uh, we should just note that the, the Swedish hernia registry captures like 98% of uh, groin hernia repairs in the country. Um, and that like the QC, it relies on surgeon entered data. Um, so table one, um, uh, so the, the authors found that the incidence of chronic pain that Kayla touched on was uh, at one year was 15.2%. And so table one demonstrates the similarities between the responders and non-responders. Um, and then uh, in baseline characteristics, and then down at the bottom, um, they have the, uh, the report of chronic pain um, from the randomly selected uh, non-responders that 
received a telephone call. And so the, the pain in that group was only 2.5%. Um, so suggesting that non-responders tended to have much lower uh, chronic pain than patients who responded to the survey. Um, next in table two, the authors divided um, patients up by the operative approach in order to identify any differences in pain or occurrence between the different types. Um, notably, the recurrence rates in TEPs as uh, well as the open preperitoneal mesh repairs were nearly twice those in open anterior repairs, uh, like the reoperation for recurrence. Um, and we'll talk about that later. Um, then let's see, uh, table three uh, did a multivariable logistic regression to, um, and uh, still found, uh, or one found that TEP approaches predicted a slightly lower likelihood of chronic pain, like an odds ratio is 0 0.84 when compared to um, open anterior repair, like a lichensine. Um, and then additionally that the TEP and the preperitoneal repairs uh, were found to be associated with an increased need for reoperation. Um, and uh, so, so that held true even on multivariate analysis. Uh, the median follow-up for measurement of recurrence was um, about 2.5 years. So, um, so the, the loss to analysis follow-up, um, just uh, again, they, they reached out to 444 patients. Um, they ultimately got uh, responses from 119, um, and the, the rate of, of um, chronic pain in that group was 2.5%. Um, and then the reliability test, um, sending those uh, questionnaires out one month after the first completed one. So that's 680 patients, they got 640 back. Um, and so this is um, measured with the Cohen's Kappa, um, so, so the kappa being 0.85 shows moderate reliability. Um, so, to so the kappa um, measures inter-rater reliability for categorical data. And so, um, to put that number in context, like above 0.75 is is excellent, um, good reliability. 0.4 to 0.75 is in that moderate, and then below 0.4 is poor. And so. Um, so the rate of chronic pain in this study is certainly high and, and, and higher than the rates of randomized controlled um, uh, trials that the study references, um, and, which typically range in the single digits. And so um, some limitations, uh, there was no preoperative pain assessment for these patients um, to kind of compare what that changes over time. Um, and, and identify predictors for post-operative pain. Um, there were relatively few TAP repairs, um, so it was hard for them to have enough numbers to see if TAPs act like TEPs. Um, but then, interestingly, there was this rapid increase in surgeons performing TEP um, from like 9 to 25% over the couple of years of the study. Um, so, so we wonder if that could factor into the recurrence and recurrence requiring a reoperation rates seen in the TEP repairs. Um, and then uh, just the, the hernia registry, the Swedish hernia registry um, lacks some of the granularity that we have in the QC, um, which the authors note um, can make it a little difficult to identify specific things within a, a type of repair that could contribute to predicting symptoms uh, or post-operative pain or recurrence. Um, and then <clears throat> I think um, you, you, there wasn't sort of the uh, how to interpret the loss to follow-up analysis, but if you were to extrapolate 2.5% for those 8,000 patients and put them together, that would, that would kind of put the, the chronic pain incidence at 11.9%, which is right around what, what Kayla was mentioning. Um, so uh, do you want to stop and, and talk some more about that paper? Yeah, let's talk about that paper. So, so I guess the, I mean, I guess part of this is also like understanding papers and stuff. So how would you, if you were to sort of get it trying to design a study to answer the question, how would you go about it, Kevin? Um, so, so I think that I think that this is like a really good start to try and say like, okay, let's um, look at these patients and try and find out what a true incidence is 
Um, and, um, uh, but I, I think the, the way I would want to, to study something is, is to be, uh, to get more specific. Like, I think this is a, a great, um, starting point and it kind of looks at all the different types of operations. Um, but to, to get like really granular data to try and limit as many things that can, um, uh, as many confounding variables as possible, like picking one operation, assessing baseline pain, following those patients up. Um, and uh, I, I think it give a, a little more insight um, because we know that each of these operations has a different, um, uh, a different sort of risk profile um, and, and patients I think respond to them a little differently. Yeah, I think, you know, it's kind of one of the things you mentioned in, in limitations and, and kind of contrast the Swedish database to the QC and the granularity that we get in the QC. But there's certainly a role for this sort of research when you don't have much information at all uh, on the topic and getting an incidence is probably more beneficial, you know, through something even larger where you're, you're actually, you know, pretty um you know significantly capturing the population whereas you you not you know you're not missing certain certain uh people whereas you know this you know, we get more granular data in the qc but it is also also somewhat selective in that it's surgeons who want to participate in it so you know we're not we, we are missing patients throughout the u.s so i think for the purpose of the study um you know using that database is is actually pretty beneficial to get high level, you know, 30,000 foot view of something. And then from that, I think that's when you start to dig down and get granular when you need to get this sort of QC level data. And that's why it's kind of my question is, you know, really, all right, so if you were to get into the QC and take this to the next level, you know, with our benefit of granular data, where would you go with it? Sort of a, uh, that's at least my thoughts there. We can we can move on to the next paper, and then at the end we can discuss like some more specific questions that are in the chat. Cause there's a lot of go, there's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah, I'm trying to go back and forth to listening to Kevin and getting the chat, so I apologize if I'm like missing <laughs> <laughs> some of one and the other. Yeah, well, let's go back through the, through the chat at the end. Oops. Um, okay, uh, so the next paper also came from Sweden um, and was in the uh, British Journal of Surgery just this last year. Um, and this is a randomized controlled trial involving uh, males older than 25 undergoing an elective unilateral groin hernia repair um, that were randomized lightweight versus heavyweight mesh. Um, and the primary outcome for this uh, is, is pain at a decade post-op. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this sort of study design in a minute. Um, so the inclusion criteria, male, um, uh, age over 25, elective unilateral, um, and then um, the exclusion criteria, femoral hernias, uh, folks unwilling to participate in this uh, study, all of these repairs were performed under local, um, and then uh, any bleeding disorders or, or need for anticoagulants. Um, so this was an expertise-based randomized controlled trial, um, which is interesting. So essentially the, the surgeons said, I like to do this repair with heavyweight, or I like to do this repair with lightweight. Um, and they were put in two groups, um, a lightweight and the heavyweight group, and then patients were randomized to those groups. Um, so, so you, you lose an element of blinding, but what you, um, conceivably gain is, is there, um, you know, the surgeon is as comfortable as they can be with that operation. Um, and, um, and so it's, um, I, I think like that trial design makes a lot of sense, um, for certain interventions, like, like when you have different um, providers doing the different interventions, like uh, angioplasty versus cabbage. Um, but I, I'll say I like personally, it, um, changing just the piece of mesh, um, it doesn't seem to me like you need to have 
different groups of surgeons using different meshes um, and, and that, that you, you lose something from the lack of blinding there. Um, so to go through uh, their consort diagram, there were uh, ultimately 412 patients randomized, um, nine and 12 patients in the two groups ultimately declined surgery. So um, 197 in the, in the heavyweight group um, operated on and uh, 194 in the lightweight group. And so this is you know, 10 years ago for the sort of primary study, which was like one year follow-up. Um, and then, um, they, uh, had a, a fair bit of loss to follow up, um, for, uh, like a few reasons, most notably, um, between that one year mark and, and this, this study, uh, 29 patients died in the, um, heavyweight group, uh, 14 patients died in the lightweight group. Um, and then non-responders to the questionnaire. So at the end of the day, they received back questionnaires from 121 patients um, in the heavyweight and 150 in the lightweight group. Um, and let's see. Uh, similar to the, to the um, last study, pain was assessed with that, uh, that single question from the inguinal pain questionnaire, um, as well as with the McCarthy visual analog scale. Um, and then there were a variety of PROs that were examined as well. Um, okay, so table one compares the baseline characteristics between the two groups, demonstrates that they're fairly similar. Um, and then table two um, is the result from that short form inguinal pain questionnaire. And so um, notably, 89% of patients um, in the, or 88% of patients in the lightweight group reported no pain versus 73% um, in the um, heavyweight group. And um, if you were to kind of switch this into what we were just looking at with the prior study, um, using four or greater as the definition of chronic pain, then the, the rates of chronic pain in the heavyweight group was 5.7%, and then in the lightweight group was 3.4%. Um, and then also notable is if you go back to the original paper that published four and 12 month outcomes, there were no differences between the two groups at that time. Um, so this was uh, pain assessed by the McCarthy visual analog scale. So uh, you kind of, you have, a, it's a 150 millimeter um, scale and you, you rate where you fall on that and they kind of measure the distance. Um, and so there was no difference between the two um, groups when measured like this. Um, the authors talked about how there were clearly some patients who didn't quite understand how to use the scale and that that, um, that could have affected this, um, but they also used this in their prior publications and prior assessments of these patients. Um, and then there was the sort of uh, global assessment of groin symptoms, some of those other sort of PROs. Um, the only thing uh, notable, statistically significant was the perception of foreign material in the groin was higher in the heavyweight group, 15% uh, versus, versus only 4.5% in the lightweight group. Um, so table four and five are here, and, and uh, there was no difference in patient assessment of their symptoms compared with preoperatively. Um, and no difference between the two groups in assessment of patient satisfaction. Um, so I, I, I found this interesting because I, I would sort of intuitively expect that satisfaction would be inversely proportional to pain and, and that as, as there was more pain in the heavyweight group that I would expect less satisfaction, um, but that's not what they found. Um, so, um, so strengths of this study, I, I think one, there's excellent response rate for, for trying to follow up with patients 10 years out, um, data that was, you know, collected prospectively. Um, and then, uh, there, they, they had a relatively good standardization of operating 
cooperative technique where they kind of distributed the technique. Everyone had to do two operations observed by someone else, and make sure that everyone's on the same page before um, starting to enroll patients. Um, and then they, you know, the authors list the expertise based um, design as, as a real strength of the study. Um, but uh, I, I still, I think lack of blinding is a bit of an issue, especially when you're, um, when you're asking about sensation and, and do you feel the mesh there and, um, and, um, but uh, is, um, is something we can kind of talk about and debate. And then, um, patient population is exclusively men. Um, and then, um, and, and then they talked about the sort of um, trouble understanding the McCarthy scale that patients had. So, um, yeah, let's talk about that one. All right, I'm getting called over to the chat now back over here. So, <laughs> so, um, so one of the things, actually, I think it's important, and I think Kaylee, you can, you can explain this really well right now, given the, the trial that we're trying to design. What's the difference between VAS and uh, what we typically consider as, you know, rating somebody's pain numerically in a numerical rating scale. I don't, I don't know that everybody always knows that those two things are different. Yeah, good question. So yeah, we're designing a trial right now, um, looking at chronic groin pain after we remove mesh and not, and discussing if we should, you know, have our primary outcome be VAS, VAS, which is, a 10 um, centimeter line that's, you know, marked on one side, no pain and marked on the other side, worst imaginal pain. And patients are just supposed to like pick a mark somewhere on that line. And there's no like marks or references. They're supposed to pick a mark somewhere. And then you take a, you know, a ruler and you measure how many millimeters it is away from, you know, one side or the other. So that's how you, that's how you do bass versus NRS, the numeric rating scale is, zero to 10, so it's an 11 point scale, zero to 10, you know, how bad's your pain? And so they tell you a number, one, two, three, four, five. And so on VAS, it could be like, you know, 5.3 on a 10, on a 10 millimeter scale or whatever, but NRS is a whole number. So there's pros and cons to both of those. You can ask patients over the phone, scale of one to 10, what's your pain? But you can't do that with VAS um, and people in general, there's been studies that show that with VAS, people are more confused and they're not sure exactly how to use VAS versus they understand pick a number one through 10. So there's definitely, I thought that, I thought that this study was interesting that you got different results using different tools. So it makes me wonder all these trials that we design, should we always use two different tools to measure the same thing when we're measuring pain? Should we use two tools to see if there's, you know, congruency versus like this trial? It showed no difference with the McCarthy scale versus there was a difference um, with the IPQ. So just something to think about. Yeah, I guess so. It almost seems like, you know, with, with pain, I think one of the things to realize, you know, the complexity of it, that it almost seems like you have multiple tools and they all, show the same result, maybe there's more validity to that than if you have two tools showing opposite results. And then you may be questioning whether or not the study design was correct or if you're measuring things properly. So at the end of this, I mean, I guess, what's the take home in terms of how should we practice, Kevin? Um, so I think like with the, um, the anterior repair, um, it, it, it seems like when you put it all together, that lightweight, uh, mesh has lower, um, uh, pain profile and a similar recurrence risk compared with heavyweight mesh. Um, and that's for open Lichtenstein repairs. Um, and so the most recent, um, like meta-analysis for, for this specifically open repairs, um, was in 2019 and, and came to the same, same conclusion and, um, you know, putting all of these studies together, um, their, uh, reported incidents of pain with a follow-up somewhere between three to 60 months. It's hard because it's, um, you know, so variable between studies was uh, 14% for the low, uh, 
for the lightweight and uh, 19% for the heavyweight. Um, so, so I, I mean, I'll say like, I don't think in all of training I've ever used an ultra pro mesh, which is what all of this um, says we should be doing. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'd be curious to know, I'm not sure if we're able to do this, but in terms of uh, polling the audience, uh, how many people use heavyweight for their open inguinals? Or how many people are using lightweight? I don't know if there's any way to, can we do like a yeah, show of hands for heavyweight? Have everybody put their video up. Let's see what you guys are made of. Let's, let's, we'll raise our hands. <laughs> Let's see some some videos. So your first question was, how many people use heavyweight mesh for Lichtenstein? So <laughs> we have a couple people who are in, hands up proudly. And then some, Jeremy is not happy with us. Luke Beffa is not happy with us. <laughs> All right. How about how about light? How, how about medium weight? You should ask at least about medium weight. Yeah, medium weight. So we got okay. The people who are not happy are happy now. And do we have any light weights? I I use light weight in a young. I might use light weight in a, a younger person. In a younger. What about any difference between when you have somebody who is a BMI of twenty two or less? versus higher, would you change your mesh weight based off of that? Light for lower BMI. Light for lower BMI. And one of the reasons why I asked, and I think it's curious is because that generally is, you know, the, the population that we're looking at in this study, you know, it, it is sensitive European studies with, um, with lower body habitus. And I guess that is a question is, you know, does somebody with lower body habitus is that part of the reason why maybe they feel the mesh? I don't know that there's ever been a study that's actually shown that to be true or not, but uh, I, I only bring it up because Mike asked the question about, you know, we did heavyweight versus medium weight in ventral hernias and, and there was no patient perception difference, but in this study, there was a difference in patient perception. So, you know, why do you think that is? I, I put it in the chat, but I think it's because I think the groin and the, the ventral abdominal wall are two different uh, beasts when it comes to perception of pain. And mechanically, because we're bending constantly, I mean, that's an area that's constantly part of our mechanics. And, and neuropathically similar, there are, you know, there's three main nerves running right through that area. So I think it, it really shouldn't be considered the same as placing in the retromuscular position of the abdominal wall. Well, David, can I ask you a quick question on that? Can sure. I like push back to the whole way this discussion started uh, for Kayla and kind of how this was set up that we have a lot of, we, you know, we have a chronic growing pain problem and, you know, it's worse than recurrence and all these things. Um, but yet, I, 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 let me just, before I make my statement, I agree that groin pain can happen in any operation in the groin, whether there's mesh or not mesh, and whatever layer in the abdominal wall the mesh is placed. That, I think that's true. However, if you look at a lot of this data, and I would even kind of, Kevin, you showed that study, those were experts. But we could talk about experts as far as the mesh, but those were experts doing that operation. So is it time, and this is a question, it's meant to be provocative, where we need to step back and say, perhaps, the Lichtenstein operation is what is flawed here. And the mere placing a mesh in that space is not as great as we thought it was. And perhaps kind of to your point, David, the prepared neo retromuscular space that can be accessed open, it can be accessed lap, it can be accessed robotically. I mean, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Do we need to move mesh out of the anterior space because that's what most of this data is. And if you look at that list that you showed, Kayla, I think part of it is a mid who, you know, defined, there was one of the original kind of promoters of the Lichtenstein. All he writes about now is mesh removal. Um, so it, it, do we need to step back as a group and say, hmm, maybe it wasn't worth it? What do you think? I mean, right now, Mickey cannot control himself. 
he needs to get in a comment right here. <laughs> and he, he just uh, that was a perfect segue. Mickey, why don't you take it away? I know you want to talk. I don't need to and Rosen is saying exactly what's on my mind I, you know I, I did I think at the table though I did say that Lichtenstein is my least favorite operation for the growing exactly because of what you talk about because you're laying a piece of mesh on top of three nerves and so I think it's just a matter of, of bad luck or, or technique that you get chronic pain so I, I do think it's the repair and the anatomy so can you, Mickey, can you, because I think your approach is maybe a little bit different than what people are, are, are typically used to. How do you place your mesh through an anterior approach? So we we make an incision almost McBurney, somewhere between a McBurney and a regular uh, hernia incision and get into what most of us would call like a spagalian def defect between the um internal obliques and erectus sort of at the lateral edge of the rectus and you can either cut the rectus sheath uh transversely and retract the rectus medially and get into the retroperitoneum that way you got to go through a couple of layers of transverses abdominis fascia and transversalis fascia or you just separate the internal obliques like we do for a old-fashioned appendectomy get into the preperitoneal space, do the same dissection we did laparoscopically and put in a, a, a big sheet of mesh. We use 14 by 11 for most people, sometimes bigger, rarely ever smaller. Um, so it's the exact same repair as TEP, uh, essentially, same dissection, but you're avoiding the nerve. I mean, you, you, you do come into risk of the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve because if you over skeletonize tissues in a retroperitoneum, you'll do that. If you go out too far laterally, um, you, you, you can get in trouble with the nerves, but you avoid ilioinguinal. You see the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric on every case. You just blow right by them. So is it fair to make a statement then, because you're describing, like you said, it's a, it's a TEP but through an open approach, and the alternative is to do it laparoscopically as a TEP for a TAP, that is this statement accurate? For the purposes of chronic groin pain, we should no longer place mesh in the anterior plane ever again. No. <laughs> But wait a second, David, I think you could maybe amend that statement to um, in order to reduce the incidence of chronic groin pain, considering placing a prosthetic material in the retroperitoneum might provide, you know, a, a lower incidence. It's not going to be zero, obviously, but I, I and one thing I would kind of I mean, I've done a lot of Lichtensteins and I think it's a fine operation, but I, the one part that I don't like, and I, I'm curious with some other folks, I know Amitabh, you've done a ton of these. The, what I don't like is that it's chronic groin pain is somewhat unpredictable in that operation. Most of the time in the retroperitoneum, it's more of a technical issue about why that happens. I just think for a Lichtenstein, while there can be technical components to it, it's often just that the nerves got caught up with the mesh and they're innocent bystanders. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's hard to kind of predict who that's gonna happen in. Uh, I'm top, what do you think? I can call Mike. I mean, it is, it, you can't really predict for sure, but you know, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna look at my data in the QC. And, um, but you know, the, the other point is you have to, you have to look at scale, right? So how many people, are going to be able to do those other operations you're talking about and you know i mean i'm vested in this but there are many of my colleagues that i know that are in the private community setting that are you know they're not they just want to do the some the thing that's simplest and easiest and quickest for them you know and i think what i'm seeing more and more as, as time goes along is that it's just about getting the simplest operation in a community setting done by many many of the folks so that's that's what the issue is right now so i don't think you'll be able to get a, a convert away from that operation but if you make the comment as you said that it's it's something that can cause the pain and we're more aware of it then you know we'll, we'll, we'll probably you know change our practice a little bit and the other thing is do you define the nerves do all of us define the nerves i don't always do that but most of the time i try to 
And the QC asked, I mean, the, 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 the thing asked that question, the, the surveys, you know, the, um, when you fill out the thing, but I don't know that we all define it. I try my best to do it, but I don't always do that. I'm, I'm a tab. Let, let, let me, let me stir the pot a little bit. Do you think common bile duct injuries are okay in this day and age? No. So why should chronic pain be? It's much more prevalent than common bile duct injuries. And we've just said that we may have a solution for part of the problem. So just because it's inconvenient for surgeons to learn it, it's okay. Well, but just Mickey, the one thing I would just, put, I, I, I kind of said it to be like controversial, but just to push back for a second on it is if everybody switches to prepare it to kneel, surgery and like let's just say and i agree with Amitabha, but let's just for the sake of argument there's some benefit to industry where there's this massive push to train everybody to do this um like maybe somebody invented a robot um and uh all of a sudden this is like everywhere that i think that we have to be cautious where um all of a sudden you might start to see things you've never seen before in your life so, so I, I think it's, it's too early to tell. I just think that the data really, if you look at it critically, suggests that chronic groin pain happens for everything, but it is much more prevalent, even including taking consideration the denominators in anterior mesh space repairs. And so, um, you know, what, nobody knows what happens when the masses do things, but I, I, I just, it, it, uh, David, what do you think about, you got to take out a lot of mesh. Yeah, I was just going to say, I would add to that, yes, that uh, the rate in the literature for anterior is certainly higher than posterior. But mesh removal for an anterior versus a posterior mesh removal, to me, I mean, I would rather do 10 anterior mesh removals than five, you know, lapping little mesh removals. I mean, those I lose at least three months off my life every time I take out a, a lap piece of mesh. But, you know, the, the risks are just higher when you're just trying to carve it off of the iliac vessels. And, and you can get into the debate about, well, how much do you really need to take out? And I, you know, I think if you're getting in there to, to do this for, for pain, you, you do have to get as much out as you possibly can. Um, so from a management standpoint and the risk associated with that, is that sort of one to 2% difference in chronic groin pain rates between anterior and posterior worth it to tell everybody to go do a prepared meal repair because you're not eliminating it as much as you know it is not a common bile duct injury it is a you're putting a foreign material into a space where material wasn't necessarily meant to be so so there is always going to be people who perceive that it sits against nerves, no matter how good of a repair you do. So, so I wouldn't tell everybody, I would tell everybody that whatever operation you do, as long as it's not a plug, and as long as it's not a PHS, whether it's a Lichtenstein, an open prepared meal, or a laparoscopic repair, is learn how to do it as best as you can, take your time with it, and do not shortcut somebody's angle to hernia surgery. Because now, I, I think a well-done anterior approach can be just as good as a well-done posterior approach. That's my soapbox. Really hate to interrupt here, but um, I was just wondering, are these like walking W's or no? What is a walking W? What was that comment? Did anybody get that comment? No, I mean, if somebody said a W to me, I'd only consider that we're winning. So yeah. that's the only thing that W that's means to nothing me. but wins. That's all I ever hear. We're winning. <laughs> uh, Mark Glover had his hand up earlier. Do you have a comment or a question? I think he was answering that survey. We have a question from the audience. Um, how much groin pain do you think is due to the tax, not necessarily the mesh? Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Um, I, I mean, I think tack injuries are, are, they're rare. They're a very low percentage of it, but I think those are the ones, and that's kind of in the chat, we were kind of discussing earlier about, you know, taking somebody back to the operating room for pain. 
I think those are the ones you can catch early on. I mean, that is a specific type of pain where somebody has a sharp electric radiating pain. Maybe you don't get it immediately after. If they have a nerve block or you put something in there that's going to you know, numb them up for 48 hours, they may, it may not show until you know, they call your office for, you know, 48 hours later saying that they're having a lot of pain. But if that is present, I think those are the things that should be caught. So if you're placing tax, obviously the principles of it, make sure you can feel the tip, make sure you're above the iliopubic tract, but everybody can still catch a nerve. So you got to be aware of those things. And um, so those are the type of things that I, I do believe that those can be caught early. And those are worth going back to back to the OR sort of as soon as possible uh, for those. But I do think it's a rare event. There's another question in the chat. They're seeing a lot of patients being referred for chronic groin pain after lap repairs. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> so have we. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, I'm I'm trying to figure out, is this a denominator uh, issue that, you know, I, I don't know what the rates of, you know, lap repairs are now around us, but um, I'm seeing a lot more robotic repairs too. And I, I don't know, you know, if that is a, a, a technique issue and sort of failing to learn the technique or if that's a mesh issue, I will say that um, it's more common that when you do go back and remove inguinal mesh that it is not laying flat. But there are certainly people who have flat mesh who have pain and I think you can get irritation of the pelvis. But uh, I'm seeing a lot more minimally invasive too, which is why I would also, you know, going back to advocating for anterior versus posterior, I don't advocate for one over the other. You know, I still think anterior done well is a perfectly fine operation. Hey, David. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. We just uh, analyzed the QC data um, that we all capture for how to handle nerves, and we just limited it to open anterior uh, approaches and we compared um, one nerve, two nerve and three nerve identification and just looked at pain at six months. Um, essentially, there's zero difference at six months for what it's worth. Um, in fact, there may be some increased pain um, for the three nerve identification, maybe because people are just dissecting more and trying to hunt around for it. Um, but we're going to hopefully publish that in the next month or so. You know, going back to some of the comments, and I think uh, Amitabh made this comment as well about um, surgeons just want a simple repair and just be done with it. I think that also plays into MIS approaches. Um, I do think there is some benefit to take the time and kind of dissect out in correct planes. Um, you can get chronic groin pain with any approach. Um, I mean, if you do it hastily, it's going to be a problem. And uh, I, I do think that's one of the attractiveness of the anterior approach. Uh, you know, however we kind of feel about it, it's quick. Surgeons feel that it gets the job done. And most people are worried more about recurrence probably than chronic pain at the time of the operation. Again, I'm not making a comment one way or the other. Um, I just think that there's probably some haste involved with all this as well. Yeah, I would comment also on the first part that you talked about the study with the one nerve two, or two versus identifying two or three. Um, I think the it's more about nerve awareness and understanding neuroanatomy than it is about identification of each specific nerve. And if you if you're nerve aware, I think you can do these anterior approaches without certainly without dissecting out the nerves uh, to identify them. So um, I've always felt you don't have to identify all the nerves, but you need to be nerve aware of the course, expectations of where it's gonna be when you're putting sutures, um, you know, interrupted sutures on the anterior, on, on the superior portion, um, making the, make, uh, placing them transversely. There's you know things to keep you nerve aware rather than identifying uh, every nerve. Mickey does not agree with that statement. I can tell. No, I concur with that actually. I mean, I think nerve aware. I like that very much. That that exactly is is sort of what I think. Because sometimes you can't find the nerve, and the more you go looking for it, especially ilio inguinal, you have to dissect up high, 
um, under the external oblique aponeurosis. So to me, if you know you're away from it, then a lot of time you're safer. And then if you're not using um, permanent suture in that area, that also helps. Because that's the question that's also asked. You do you use absorbable or permanent suture? Uh, I use permanent suture because uh, I'm using a permanent mesh also. So I don't I don't typically think it's that big of a deal. But I'd be curious to know if others do differently. I wonder what uh, Mr. Goodman here is doing with this. Do you think he's more permanent or do you think he's more absorbable? <laughs> uh, I, I think what uh, Mr. Goodman is trying to say is he's just really supportive of your topic because um, I, I've been seeing he's been running like many fundraisers for everybody and I have been able to be part of that as the Living Double W community. So I think we should just like let him speak his point of view because He's been really inspirational to me and all the other living W's that have that have been supporting him. All right, thanks, JJ. All right, is there any other comments, uh, Kayla, uh, Mike? Do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap this up? I think Kayla's going to take it away for the living W. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that, but no. So I came in because it's just sorry because my friend and I know him well, but I, I was diagnosed with. Um, like ankylosis spondylitis. So I kind of want to just learn some information. <laughs> this is because uh, Rosen put it on Twitter. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kayla, take all it right. away. Sounds good. Well, thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. This is a good talk. Um, next month, we're going to talk about abdominal wall anatomy and truly understanding it. Dr. Jake Greenberg is going to be moderating that with Luciano Tolstati and Sam Zolan.